recorded. All right, Ms. Gavin, whenever you'd like to begin. And I don't hear you, Ms. Gavin. I think you're on mute. Hello. Yep, I can hear you now. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, and hello, my name is Carol Gavin, and I will be leading the meeting today. I'm excited to do that. A reminder that this meeting is through Zoom, and there may be members of the commission or members of the public who are joining us through audio only. We'll continue to follow a specific format to ensure everyone is listening, can have, can follow along. I will announce each agenda item as seen on each side and provide direction on motions. If there is a presentation, I'll invite the speaker to begin. Afterwards, commissioners can ask questions, can ask any technical questions that require clarification, but we must allow for public comment before any discussion by commissioners can begin. Call to order. The Senior Citizen Commission meeting for Thursday, January 12th is called to order at 2.30 p.m. I will now begin roll call. As I read each commissioner's name, please respond with present. Leonie, um, well, I'm not gonna mess the uh, last name up. I'm uh, present, are you here? I'm Le present, yes, hi. All right, hi. Elizabeth Lansky. Uh, Elizabeth Lasensky, present. Lasensky, okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Ron Cole. Present. Lisa Miller. Present. Tom Gerberson. Present. Jim Daniel. Present. Um, we welcome our new alternate commissioner, Thomas Hover. Present. And myself, Carol Gavin, we have a full panel today. Um, approval of the agenda. Will a commissioner make a motion to approve the agenda? Please state your name. Jim Daniel, I, I move approval of the agenda. A second. Uh, Elizabeth Lutsky, oh, go ahead. I. So Elizabeth, are you the second? I, I can be, but somebody else spoke up, so whichever. Yeah. Who, who was that? Was that you, Ron? I second it, yes, Ron Cole. Okay. So Ron Cole will second. I will now ask each commissioner to vote yes or no. Leilani? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Ron? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Tom? Yes. Oh, I don't vote. So, oh, that Tom. And we have two Toms. E either one, absolutely, yes. Tom Gerberson. Jim? Yes. And, and my yes, you are correct, Tom, that because you're an alternate and that we have a full house today, you don't vote. So thank right, you. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay. And I also approved the agenda. Um, brief announcement. Welcome to our new council. Um, Commissioner Batu Vetla, would you like to share a little about yourself? And I'm looking, I don't see um, Bapu on the line. However, if you'd like, I can just very briefly read uh, a statement from the um, city page. Um, he was excited to be on our commission and he did state though that he would be traveling during this time, but for future agendas, he'd hope to be available consistently. And so he was elected to the Davis City Council in November, 2022 and um, Excuse me, I don't know how to pronounce um, if it's Bapu Vaitla or Vaitla, but we will find out from him hopefully next month. Um, he works on issues of gender inequality with Data 2X, an initiative housed in the United Nations Foundation. His core interest is the relationship between social cooperation and the well being of children. He studies why people decide to work together or not for mutual benefit and the effects of these decisions on public policy political movements, and ultimately the lives of children and youth. 
He was born in India, grew up in California. He holds a BA in nature and culture and an MS in international agricultural development from UC Davis, as well as a PhD in international relations, political economy from Tufts University. He has received the Mickey Leland International Hunger Fellowship, a Fulbright scholarship and a postdoctoral fellowship from Harvard University. So uh, we certainly welcome him when he's available um, to come and speak and, and give his own uh, bio. But um, we also, as uh, Commissioner Gavin will say, we, we have uh, a, new, uh, a new member of our own commission. Go ahead, Ms. Gavin. Um, and the new member, Tom Hober, would you like to tell us something about yourself? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, first off, I'm honored to be here and join your group. I'm looking forward to working with you all. I grew up in Philadelphia um, and moved out to California in 1963. Uh, spent 30 years or so in Sacramento and then another 20 or so in Berkeley before moving here to Davis only a year and a half ago. Uh, my career principally involved uh, founding uh, and publishing the California Journal, which was a nonpartisan uh, magazine on California state government and politics. Um, I did that for over 30 years. Um, and I also had a, uh, I served on the Sacramento City Council at one point. Uh, and also in my checkered career, I also taught courses uh, part-time at uh, a couple of CSUs and uh, here at uh, UC Davis. I've uh, served on a lot of boards and commissions over the years. Uh, maybe the two most noteworthy were uh, an organization called Loaves and Fishes in Sacramento that serves uh, the homeless population. And uh, uh, I served on the Sacramento County Civil Service Commission. Uh, so a uh, lot, of, lot of different threads to uh, my background, but I'm, as I say, very, very glad to be here working with you. Thank you, Tom. So we are on public comment. At this time. No, I have a I have a, an announcement. Oh, all right, oh. Elizabeth. I didn't see your hand. That's all right. Uh, I just want to announce that uh, next Thursday, January 19th at two o'clock, we are having at Rancho Yoa, we are having a speaker. Uh, Kathleen Devlin Shovlin from the Society for the Blind will be talking about low vision uh, impairment and she'll be bringing some devices that might be useful to people. And this is an event that uh, for a, a change, Rancho Yellow will have open to the public, but you must show proof of vaccination and wear a mask. All right. Are there any more announcements? Um, I have just one quick announcement, which is uh, February will be our last Zoom meeting. We will resume in-person meetings in March, and those will be at our council chambers, which is where the city council members meet, and still the same schedule every second Thursday at 2.30 p.m., but we will be in person beginning in March. And will masks be required or not? For all other city uh, locations, they are encouraged, but not required. Are there any more announcements? Seeing that there are none, we're going to go to public comment. At this time, any member of the public may address the commission on matters which are not listed on this agenda or are listed on the consent calendar. Speakers will be limited to no more than three minutes. Speakers will be asked to state their name for the record. We do not have, do we have anyone for public comment? You do have one hand raised from Francesca Wright. Uh, Francesca? 
Hello, <clears throat> hello, staff and commissioners. Um, and it's always exciting when we can meet face to face, but I would just like to register that the option of making meetings available via Zoom um, makes it available for people who for a myriad of reasons are not able to attend. And I would just like to voice if it's possible to have a hybrid model where um, Zoom participation may also be available. I believe that engenders greater participation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Francesca. Commissioner Gavin, I will relay that to our city clerk. I think that we are um, constrained by Brown Act to go to the traditional format, the pre-COVID format, but I will inquire to be sure that that, that is the case. Um, thank you, Maria. Uh, may I insert something, Maria? Just just to be clear, I think what Francesca was Francesca was proposing is that uh, others, outsiders, not the commissioners themselves, be able to participate on Zoom. So, and I, yeah, but, I'll inquire but, about that. Our meetings haven't traditionally been. Um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. So we, as commissioners, would attend but that members of the public could participate via Zoom. Yes, thank you. That's the, that's the question, yeah. Are there any more comments? Seeing, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. It's okay, there's no hand raised at this. All right, um, so the, Meeting, we're now moving to the consent calendar. And all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered routine and non-controversial. Require no discussion and items are expected to have unanimous support and be enacted by one motion. So, the meeting minutes, November the 10th. That was a while ago. Yeah. Having reviewed the minutes, does any commissioner have any questions or comments? If not, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Please state your name for the record. Um. Uh, um, Cole, I had a couple of uh, corrections you know, to the minutes or okay. addition. Okay. Under, uh, <clears throat> uh, on the second page, under um, regular items, uh, social services and housing, the uh, next to last sentence. Um, uh, said and facility more public private partnerships. I I'll facilitate. Thank you. I believe it should be facilitate. Yep. Good catch. Thank you. The uh, second correction is under uh, B of that same uh, item uh, discussion of rotation chair position. And I believe instead of Commissioner Cole, it should be Commissioner uh, Daniel. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Who was very, who was very kindly stepped up <laughs> to do something. I guess I'm not that kind, but uh, <laughs> I think I think if that you would, if you'd like to do it, Rob. <laughs> no, no, that's what I. That's why I'm saying I was going to. I was going to compliment you for stepping up. <laughs> I appreciate that. Jim, we tried, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Thank you for that. All right, so now do we have uh, an amendment to accept the changes made to the minutes? I'll, I'll move to, oh, sorry, Elizabeth, everyone keeps jumping in over you. No, go <laughs> ahead, go ahead, Tom. Okay, uh, I'll move to accept the minutes with the modifications noted by Ron. Do I have a second? I second, Elizabeth Lisenski. All right, thank you. Now I'm going to ask each member to state whether or not they approve. Leilani? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. 
Ron? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Tom Gerberson? Yes. Jim? Yes. And I approve. Okay. Okay, that passes. Then we will go to, um, well, we did have, we're on six. All right, so we're going to go to transportation resources. And um, we're going to have a presentation by Yellow Bus, I believe. All right. And Mr. Reeks is on the line. Um, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Eric writes, I'm not right. sure if I'm coming up on video yet. You are. You're oh, unmuted. except you except you've muted yourself. There it is. Now you're good. Too many controls on these things. So, um, good afternoon, uh, Eric Wrights with uh, Yolo County Transportation District. Um, we are uh, the agency that oversees uh, transportation services for Yolo County. Um, we work in tandem with Unitrans and Davis Community Transit to provide. Uh, transit service within um, the city of Davis and um, for uh, uh, inner city trips outside of Davis. Um, within the city of Davis, we provide inner city route uh, 42A and 42B, um, which provide uh, Davis with access to uh, the city of Woodland, uh, Sacramento International Airport, um, West Sacramento and downtown Sacramento. Um, besides the, the fixed route service, we also um, provide the inner city service uh, for paratransit service, um, taking people from the city of Davis um, to various locations, both within um, Yolo County and within um, Sacramento County. Um, I was going to keep this kind of short and, and see what kind of questions were out there. Um, about the transit service that's available um, to members of uh, the Davis community. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions at this time? Elizabeth. I do. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank you for rerouting uh, the um, 42A and 42B onto 5th Street. Um, I live in Rancho Yellow, and, and that is a great change for us. It, it makes those buses very accessible. Um, however, uh, most of us here are still in pandemic mode, and, and taking public transit is um, not high on the priority, but I look forward to uh, having our residents um, use that bus uh, a lot in the future. Um, I do have a question. Was the bus that went from Davis to Winters and then to um, Vacaville, has that been completely done away with? Eric? You're muted. You're muted. Thank you. I guess I need to stop playing with this so much. So, um, so uh, the service that you're talking about was called the Route 220. Um, it provided that inner city connection. Um, it was um, it was canceled during COVID. Um, it is a service that we will be looking at bringing back. Um, currently, the those areas have a, a service called Micro Transit Service, which is a curb to curb service. Um, where people get to call in and request a ride. Um, I know the city of Winters uh, residents are, are um, they, they like that service, um, but I do know there's also a need to provide fixed route service um, between those uh, three cities. Um, can, I, can I toss in the fact that um, uh, Vacaville is an important stop? Uh, a lot of our residents, well, some of our residents uh, go to Kaiser. Yes. 
and, and I, I know in the past what we've had is um, we have provided uh, ADA paratransit service out there, um, along with having that um, 220 stop. Um, I, I didn't like where it stopped, to be honest with you. Um, it was on the main drag there, and Kaiser hadn't really provided a, a good access between um, the main road and the, the facility. Um, but we used to stop there with the fixed route, too. And, and can you tell us again how often the 42A and 42B uh, go through Davis? Um, I think you've increased the um, frequency. Frequen yes. And actually, um, starting Sunday, we'll be increasing the frequency um, even more. So um, right now, um, you have 30 minute service in the AM and then 45 minutes throughout the day. Um, starting uh, Sunday, uh, let's see, January 15th. Um, the service, we're adding nine additional trips. Um, mostly those additional trips are to provide a 30 minute service um, in the PM uh, peak time. Um, and it also offers uh, additional trips in the evening. Thank you. You're welcome. It looks Dan like Jim has his hand up. Jim Daniel. Jim. Yeah. Daniel. Uh, <laughs> Just as clarification, I guess, uh, since your presentation was uh, brief, it, since we are concerned about uh, the senior citizens, uh, many of whom or some of whom have mobility issues, uh, what is the procedure if there is a bus breakdown, uh, an emergency of some sort for dealing with people on the bus who may have mobility issues, for example, running into a flooded road, or that sort of thing? Uh, well, I, I will tell you, we, we just had a big deal with this um, this last uh, weekend um, with the, between, it was basically Saturday through Monday, we had large amounts of rain. Um, we witnessed some, um, I, I don't want to call them localized flooding because it seemed a little bit more than localized, but um, flooding throughout the county. Um, and uh, we had routes such as our Route 215 that actually had to be suspended. Um, when we do that, we try to, um, first and foremost, we try not to get in that position where um, people have to be um, taken out of the vehicles, um, just because we understand the requirement for providing a safe um, entry and exit location from our buses. Um, and our drivers are, are tend to be trained not to, to stop or try to pick up or deboard anybody um, in an area that is not um, wheelchair or, or ADA accessible. Um, I know a lot of people wonder why we can't just pick anybody up who's walking along the sidewalk um, and why we really stick to having bus stops that we use. Um, and that is for that reason is they those areas have been uh, determined to be safe and accessible and um, allow us to get people on and off the buses. Um, in cases of emergency, our drivers are, are, are trained to try to make sure that the, the, um, that the customer's safety is the first and foremost. Um, I know we've had a lot of times when people have not deboarded the bus just because there was nowhere safe to deboard them. Um, and actually mechanical issues were dealt with um, with the passenger on the vehicle. So um, at, at Yolo Bus and, and um, both with our drivers and, and with our, our staff, we're constantly trying to um, make sure that safety is our top priority and, and that goes to, all the way to the public, so. Thank you. Elizabeth? Yes, I forgot to ask. Um, in the past, we, uh, as senior citizens, we could get a senior pass to board the buses and uh, it, it was a dollar. Um, then at one point it was a dollar 10 and I don't know what it is now. Uh, so first question is, what is the current um, fare amount? And B, can we now use the new, um, hmm, there are new like uh, transit cards that um, you can pay. Connect cards. Yeah, I mean, in the Bay Area, they're uh, clipper cards. I don't. 
Uh, so to start with the answering that question, because you got a lot going on there, Elizabeth. Uh, first of all, yes, we still have a senior um, rate. Um, our fare structure um, is a little complicated, but um, we'll work on making that a little bit better. I, I'm a big person on things being as simple as possible. So um, right now, um, the there's two different fares for, for transit service. One is for local and one is for inner city. Um, and so the local fare is $2 and the inner city fare is $2.25. Um, however, with that senior ID, um, it is only a dollar. So that, that should make that a little bit easier instead of trying to, to have it be the 110. Um, second of all, yes, uh, Yolo Bus does accept the Connect card. So if you have a Connect card that has already been set up with um, your senior pass and senior ID, um, you can tap those when boarding um, the Yolo Bus. Are there any more questions? Oh, uh, just what is the process of getting an ID? Um, so right now, um, the process for getting the ID is that uh, customers come into the um, YOLO uh, Transportation District office. It's at 350 Industrial Way um, in Woodland. Um, I know one of the things that I've been hearing from customers, um, in particular seniors, is um, a want to have us come out and do remote IDs, um, which I, I know in the past we have done um, but a, a while back and before COVID. Um, but I do think that uh, connecting with our, our agencies that, that work closely with seniors and having, um, you know, portable uh, uh, ID would be a, a good thing to do. Could I ask a couple questions myself, just to find out how many people, how many people uh, have used the uh, fixed route bus service in Davis? Yeah. Great. I've used it as well. Errol? And, and um, I, I'm guessing mostly the, the Route 42. So um, wh when you use that service, are, are you using it within Davis or uh, to connect with other cities? In my case, this is Elizabeth, in my case, uh, when I used it, and it hasn't been since COVID, sorry, but when I did use it, uh, mostly we used it to go to um, Sacramento to either like the museum area, Crocker Museum area, or to the state capitol, or um, back when the route was different, we would go to uh, the community theater. Uh, yeah, when it was down on 14th Street. Right, and, and it's now much further away. So I, I don't know whether those of uh, my friends who are not so mobile, whether that's going to work for them. But, you know, we're waiting for COVID to kind of lift and see where things go. I understand that. And the one of the reasons I asked it is for that exact question. I have been getting uh, different comments from, from different groups about um, not getting down towards where the convention center convention center or um, the theater is. And um, so I figured I'd ask this group about it too. So Lisa? Yeah, my husband you... and I like to um, use the bus to go to the airport. It saves a lot on parking. Great. It's real convenient. On that note, we too, on the um, the improvement of service, when we changed the route, I know we um, had some connection uh, issues at the uh, County Fair Mall that we are working on um, to, to make sure that uh, there's kind of a seamless connection between uh, people coming from Davis and the airport. So, and was it Carol who also commented well, about you? I've, I've used it to go into Sacramento and and in, in the inner city, and I've also used the uh, 220 as well, and um, a few places in Woodland, but uh, basically I would be going into Sacramento 
I mean, I did use it. Great. I, I always like to ask just to see if there's something else I should add that that's coming up. Um, right now, we're looking at, um, you know, making improvements to the Woodland Local Service. Um, and we, as we uh, come out of COVID, we'll be looking at, I, I guess, just about every service and, and how it can be improved to, to provide maximum uh, accessibility to, to Yolo County. So. Any other questions, comments? Elizabeth? Yeah, I would like to put in a plug for um, making it much easier for any of our, our seniors to get one of the um, those ID cards, the, the uh, universal, whatever you're calling that, um, yeah. connect card. Uh, going to industrial way in Woodland uh, is, is not realistic for people who are already taking the bus. Uh, so whatever you can do to make uh, make it more accessible to not just Davis, but uh, like West Sacramento people, um, that would be appreciated. Agreed. Uh, um, on the Connect card, um, do, do you think there, there's a good amount of seniors who, who are going to want to use that? Or do you think um, the IDs are going to be the bigger thing to get the discount? Oh, you, you mean you can only have one or the other? No, no, no. You can have, um, so with it, with the, the idea behind the connect card is that you can put money on it so you don't carry cash around. That That's the purpose of the connect card. You can get an ID without getting a connect card. Yes, but when you sign up for your connect card, can, do you already, do you plug in that you are a, a senior? ahead of time so that the rate whenever you use that card already automatically pops up at the senior rate. Correct, correct. It, it, it's, um, it's connected in that way when you, when you get a Connect card, yes. So you get the discount with the Connect card. It's just a, a matter of if uh, people are going to want to use that technology or want to pay cash. That's all I'm asking. You know, I, I really don't know. Uh, I think we're in a transition with a lot of seniors who are moving uh, to more technology, but that's not everyone. Yeah. Well, and that's why I like to ask. And Eric, how do you get, how does a senior get the connect card? Um, the same thing would uh, apply with the connect card as applies with the, the senior ID. So um, you can get a senior ID and we, we print it on the back of, of a regular card or you can get your senior ID and it, it's printed on a connect card. Um, either way, you would get the discount and it, it's set up to, um, to provide that discount. Uh, it, the big thing about a connect card is how you use it and, and putting uh, funds on it so that um, you don't have to carry the cash. Yeah, I understand that. I, I, I guess I, maybe I didn't hear you clearly where, how, does someone get the connect card? Do they also go to Industrial Avenue? Yes, yes. Um, 350 Industrial Avenue, we do the connect cards um, with the IDs. Um, you, they also do it in Sacramento at the Sacramento Regional Transit uh, Customer Service, but that's that's on our street and, and quite a ways into Sacramento. So um, I'm figuring it's more likely to be Woodland. Um, but one of the things, if we were to do like a mobile um, uh, ID, we could go ahead and include the them as connect cards or um, as just IDs. But at the uh, moment, at the moment, you can't get it just online. Is that that correct? is correct. Thank you, Leilani. Thank you. Yes, Eric, I'm wondering, it sounds like um, you're going through um, a promising process of getting, doing some updates and to your programming. And um, uh, I'm wondering if you've identified, if your agency has identified any ways that different regional cities um, that you serve, that the cities might be able to assist uh, your agency with facilitating and collecting the feedback from potential users that, that you might be seeking? 
Um, I would tell you, I am always big on connecting with community groups. Um, I, I have to explain that um, I uh, used to work at, at YCTD, uh, probably it's, it's been almost eight years now. Um, and when um, I did, the community relationships that we had with, with different organizations was always a very important part of, of what I thought my work was, um, especially with uh, doing service planning. Um, and to give you an idea with the, the Woodland Local Service, um, we've already connected with a large number of, of different stakeholders. Um, everybody from the Woodland Community College to, um, to the Visit Woodland, to the Chamber of Commerce, um, the Lions Club. Um, we've been really reaching out to, to the members of the community to try to get feedback. And, and I do really believe that that's an important part of uh, making sure that the service is, is not just something that we thought up, but uh, something that, that is community needed. So um, in Davis, I'm, I'm trying to remember a lot of the groups. Uh, we used to work very closely with the uh, both Davis bike clubs um, I know we used to have a very great relationship um, with this commission. Um, we, I was talking with um, Maria about this earlier, uh, about the different members that we worked with. Um, and, and also in Davis, um, the, the different uh, school boards, because everybody has a different, uh, so they're called parent teacher boards and, or every school has a little bit different name for them. So um, we find a lot of those groups are very connected to the community and, and give us access to, to everybody so that we can hear um, uh, the voices that, that are out there about different kinds of service. Great, thank you. That sounds like really great work. Um and community relationships. And I hope that you will, as a commissioner here, I hope that you will continue to communicate with, with us as well, if there are ways that we could help assist with channeling communications to um, the seniors of Davis, to and from. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm actually, I got the email earlier today uh, about uh, the possibility of doing travel training, and I was really excited about that. Um, that was a program we used to be heavily involved in and, and hearing about the idea that we would do it again was really exciting to me. So um, I do also have to mention um, our, our district um, has uh, different board members um, and the city of Davis has a representative. Um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on Josh's last name, Josh Chapman, that's it. Um, it just recently is a new board member um, and we always work very closely with the, uh, the board members too, because um, they have a good connection to the community themselves. Thank you. Jim? Yes, following up on what Leilani was asking about uh, communication with the community, and I was listening to uh, some of the things you said about communities in Davis, I'd encourage you to try to reach out to some of the senior living communities. <laughs> where you may have two or 300 people uh, that might be candidates for using the service. So I'd encourage you to do that. Absolutely. Um, I know a lot of them aren't on our fixed route, but we used to reach out to them uh, in particular for our, our ADA paratransit service. Um, and um, so yes, I expect we would partner with a, a variety of groups. So. I also have to uh, make sure that I, I keep all of my neighbors happy because I am a longtime Davis resident. So um, most people in the community um, know who I am and, and I have to, to make sure I'm listening to everybody. Are there any more questions? Well, I have a few questions. Go for it. Um, in addition to what has been said in regards to um, a trip over on Industrial Avenue, I think that one could be less complicated because that would involve two buses. It, from my experience, it would involve the 42 and a connection at the County Fair Mall to a bus that goes directly um, to 
yellow bus that stops across the street from it, as opposed to that busy street where cars are either entering or, are, or exiting the freeway and, and they're driving fast. And also uh, from my experience in San Francisco, they have a procedure. Well, they wrote grant, they write grants quite a bit. And one of the grants that was written in regards to public transportation allows for seniors and disabled people in the city of San Francisco who get an ID, they have a free pass for unlimited rides. So all seniors who participate or, and or disabled people, once they get their ID uh, for the public transportation, it's free from then on. So that might be something that perhaps someone can write a grant for, or maybe we could bring that issue before the board, but I think that would um, uh, be less complicated for the seniors to write. Um, I have other questions, but Elizabeth, I see your hand. Well, I don't want to stop you from, from asking your questions. No, go ahead. Um, I just want clarification about, we used to get, and I still have my senior bus pass that I got through the senior center. Um, is that no longer going to be valid? I'm not sure which senior pass it would be. Um, is that the one that Unitrans accepts? That is the, we have senior passes, Unitrans passes. But it, is that the one, and if I remember, there were two different groups of those. Those were the ones that had like a picture on them. And then there was the ones that just were for, um, was basically the value to be able to ride the bus. Does it have your picture on it and say senior? You know, it says senior and I used it before to ride yellow bus and Unitrans uh, and get the, the discount. Well, actually Unitrans it's free, but uh, yellow bus, it was a dollar, but that's why I'm confused. So that pass is no longer going to be good on yellow bus. Is that right? No, no, no I, I do believe those that's still good on yellow bus. I just have to make sure that I'm, I'm trying getting enough information. So uh, Elizabeth, I think that's back when we, we did do a couple trips out to, to the senior center and do IDs there, both us and Unitrans. And that was um, something that, that we did. I, I remember being part of that, um, where we did a, a, a mobile ID and allowed people to, to get an actual senior ID. Um, I want to comment about um, it should still be valid. I, I question if our drivers will, will recognize it, but the, it should still be valid. Yes. So at the travel training thing that you're going to do, uh, in, maybe in May, and we've had those at Rancho Yellow too, but maybe at that travel training event in May at the senior center, could you have some sort of, uh, ID, th uh, way to create your ID there? Yeah, we could probably look at it at the very least, have somebody come out with a camera to, to take the pictures necessary and get the information and, and go from there. Are there any more questions? Well, I have a few more questions. Um, I wanted to know what is the procedure when there has been um, an interruption in the, in the regular route. I know that um, things can happen or there can be some type of accident and some of the drivers know to go to back roads and go into West Sacramento to go to um, Sacramento. Um, Sacramento has events and things are not posted in time. So what is the procedure? Because you have people who or trying to get into Sacramento and you have people who are trying to get back to Davis. Uh, you have students trying to do internships, people going to work, people trying to get home. And just from people that I know, it's been extremely frustrating when these interruptions occur and your customers are left out of the loop. Yes, I agree and, and understand the situation you're talking about. And I know 
Um, we've always been worked to uh, make sure the alerts go out via our, our text and email system that we have. Um, that you can sign up for that on our website. Um, and you can pick particular routes that you'd like to receive information for um, so that you're not getting all of them. Um, when it comes to service interruptions, if that be um, a rerouting of the service or if that be um, a, a cancellation like we recently have, um, we try to use all forms uh, of contact to, to get that word out. Um, for example, with the flooding that we saw happen Monday, um, our route 15, uh, 215 was canceled for um, about half the day. Um, we had major flooding on 16 that made um, getting through Esparto and Madison um, impossible. Um, Caltrans actually closed the road and we're not allowing people through. Um, but we did two things that I thought were very important. We went out and did as much notification as we could. Um, we worked with uh, Cash Creek Casino to notify employees um, that the bus service was going to be canceled. We went ahead and um, put it out on all of our social media and provided it through text and email. Um, but we also made the decision that we would go up to the casino um, kind of through the back routes like you were talking about. And the people that we had dropped off for work, we cut, went back to get. Um, after knowing how you use the service, I'm guessing you are talking more about um, reroutes that happen in downtown Sacramento, um, in particular ones that uh, the city doesn't notify us about and all of a sudden we're kicked off streets. Um, in those cases, we do hustle pretty hard to try to make sure we get information out via text and via our email alert system um, to notify riders that you know, oh, we just found out that they closed 10th Street, and so our express routes won't be able to, to serve the 10th and N bus stop. Um, I will tell you, it's never perfect. Um, I always think that that process can be improved, um, and I think the process gets improved most um, when you have better um, relationships with the people closing those roads. Um, because when they start thinking about you and, and being willing to share that information um, before it happens, um, it really allows you to be more prepared and spend more time communicating with the customers um, and, and a little less time um, having to, to do the emergency reroute of the bus when they hit that stop sign. So um, I do think that's a place where we could improve. Um, but I think that a lot of it comes from uh, building better relationships um, with our, our city officials and our, our, you know, law enforcement at times. So um, I know it's been fun, especially with Golden One. Um, sometimes the buses get let through, sometimes they don't. And uh, that's been kind of a frustrating thing that I've been dealing with um, since the new basketball season. Well, let's go. Let's. Let's go back to what you said in, in regards to um, communication, um, mm -hmm. dealing with Sacramento. Um, I, I have an issue with all of it in the sense that your passengers are trying to reach a particular destination and, and the coordination is not as smooth as it can be. For given what you just said, uh, I, having lived in other places, don't understand why, for the reasons you've given, there is not a GPS signal at the bus stops that would tell you these things, that would tell you they're in the bus stops in the Bay Area when the next bus is coming, if there's been a delay. And I think collaborating with Sacramento with Unitrans and Yellow Bus, your passengers would be able to know some of these things. Therefore, they would not be uh, left out of the loop or waiting an hour or longer um, for a bus that's never coming. So I would hope that something you would take into consideration that there be some type of uh, 
collaboration involving grant writing. And I think it would also be an ADA issue because you have people when they are left out of the loop, if they're gonna close the bridge and you have to take five and come in off 10th street or, or 20th and, 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 and come around, I, I know of people who were trying to get to a dialysis appointment. And this is very frustrating for them and, it's, and for all of your passengers in general as to and at this day and time, why are we not moving into the 21st century with public transportation? So, and I have another question. Um, I really didn't hear a response in, re in regards to um, when there's an emergency and you have people who may be in a wheelchair, uh, how, how you accommodate to get them off the bus. Um, I know you mentioned that there was some flooding and, and I'm aware of Title III of the ADA that you have to be able uh, within the law to let people off safely, but there are circumstances where your equipment fails what happens then? Well, and that's a, a big question. It depends on the level of safety that we have to disembord that person. Um, you know, they, uh, as the way of saying it, safety is up as of the utmost. So if, you know, uh, the bus breaks down and, and has an issue, you know, on the side of, of a country road, I, I have to, to have them, think about the safety of trying to unload somebody in that condition. And, and that's passenger safety comes, you know, has to come into mind with how that solution happens. Um, you know, unloading somebody unsafely is just as bad as, as having them have to wait um, within the vehicle. Um, well, in a, a, you know, if a, a wheel goes bad and a tire needs to be changed, you know, that's an emergency that, that, you know, I would think that we would want to keep the passenger on, especially if there's no safe way to get them off. Um, but whenever we're dealing with emergencies like that, the, the passenger's safety is of the utmost concern to us. So did, did that help to answer that, Carol? No. No, um, but I, I'm going to move on to another question. Real quickly, before you do, if I could mm -hmm. mention about what you're talking about uh, at the bus stops, they're called real-time uh, passenger information. Um, they're signs that are available to provide information about when the next bus is available. Um, Yolo Bus does use those, and, and we have them throughout Yolo County. Um, downtown Sacramento is a little different because um, we aren't the, the head group in, in Sacramento County. Sacramento Regional Transit District is. Um, and therefore, um, putting signs like that over in Sacramento is, is difficult, um, especially since a lot of times they don't have that av information available to their customers. Well, that would come back with... Uh with the collaboration and working together to, to resolve that issue. But my next question is, um, how often are the um, seats sanitized on some of the buses? Because I've seen people who saw their clothing and I, and I was curious as to about how often uh, is industrial, industrial equipment used to sanitize the seats on the buses? Uh, I would tell you that we do a, a large amount of cleaning um, on a daily basis, and then usually um, like a, a thorough, thorough cleaning um, weekly. The, the fun part is it's hard to say based on, um, how's the way of saying this, not all of our buses are in service all the time, and therefore um, it's based on when they're in service. And then also, how often uh, or do you check the uh, lift with the MCI buses? Um, the lift for all buses is part of the, um, the, the check when the drivers go ahead and do their pre-check. They, they are cycled as part of the pre-check, and that means that they're done whenever the driver goes to take them out of the yard. 
and when they're not working what what happens um with that when they when they've gone out of the yard with the bus and for whatever reason the lift is inoperable um well it shouldn't have left with the it lift being unoperable um i would tell you that it, when that happens um accommodation should be made to uh pick up people who are are not who weren't able to be picked up because the lift being inoperable. And um, my my next to last question is um, why are there no postings on yellow bus um, for violations of California? Penal Code 640. And this is a citation when people are sitting in seats that are reserved for the disabled that fold up. And if you have someone who enters and they need to be there in a the wheelchair and people refuse to get up. Now on the buses in Sacramento, it tells you it's a violation. But I'm, I think that it's a a city ordinance or a county ordinance, but I've never seen them on a yellow bus. Um, I know that we used to have um, them posted on the windows that the bus, the seats were available for seniors and for disabled. Um, yes, you have, I would have those. To check you again, have but, those. Okay, but, but you don't have. But in addition, on on the RT buses in Sacramento, they also have it's a violation of California Penal Code 640, meaning that you can be issued a citation if the police is called. But you don't have that on yellow bus. So people will say, I'm not getting up. I've paid my fare and you can't make me get up. I have not heard of that being an issue. So I guess that's probably why it hasn't been posted. Um, oh, really? I, really? I, really? Yes. Really? Do, do you have a, a time and day that you really? saw that occur? Well, I'm, I'm just asking, why, why is that? Well, I mean, how's the way of saying this? I would hope that it wouldn't escalate to the point of needing to call the police and that people would be considerate enough to to give up their seats. And that's why I I mean. Yeah, so I mean, is it are we having that large of an issue with that? It well, I'm not I'm not going to. I just find it interesting that it, that once again, in collaboration, Obviously, it is an issue if Sacramento has that. And I have seen it. I've seen it on the bus. And whether or not if drivers report it, I don't know. But I have seen that situation uh, come up where people um, do not move. They have sat down and the bus is crowded and they say, well, I'm not getting up. I've paid my fare. So, um, as I said, I'm, I'm looking into that and it seems to be something that has to be an ordinance within the area where the bus is. And so my final question is, um, I haven't seen a sign that actually say where a passenger can file a complaint with yellow bus. Is it yellow bus, yellow county, trans dev and also, I think that there should be a posting of where a person can file a complaint with the transfer with the Department of Transportation Authority. Well, I'll tell you, we, we do have our, our Title VI uh, complaint uh, information is on the buses. Um, it's up there I've, in I've never all seen four that. languages. Sorry, what was that? I've never seen it, Eric. I've never I'm seen it. I'm sorry. Um, 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 but please go on. Um, and now I would tell you that that has more to do with Title VI um, for regular complaints that, that aren't um, associated with discrimination. Um, there's a number of places on our website that, that have that information of, about providing complaints. Um, that same information is on our schedules. 
um, and, and is available on most of our, our outreach that, you know, about contacting our customer service if, if there's an issue. Um, we don't limit the ability for taking complaints. So it doesn't have to just go to TransDev, as you mentioned, or to just customer service. Um, I, since being back, even at my current role, have, have asked people to provide those complaints directly to me um, if they so feel, um, because I think it's very important to, to stay transparent and to, to have people have the ability to provide complaints. Um, so that, that would be my comment on that. Were you hoping to see like a, a, a direct phone number or an email that will be Describe that as like a bulkhead on the buses? Well, everybody has Title VI up there. But specifically, I do not see anything about um, where to make a complaint to in regards to yellow bus. And I've never seen where a person can call um, to file a complaint with the Department of Transportation because they also take complaints against uh, public transportation authorities. So it's it's very, very interesting. And sometimes I think it can be very frustrating. And um, we talk about the website and texting and, and but there's also a population and or a segment of the population who for whatever reason do not have access to all of this equipment. So some of this information posted on the bus would be wonderful. I know you mentioned there are things on the schedule, but I've been on the bus where there were no schedules at all. And I just happen to know these things. So I, I, I think the more information that is transparent, it helps everybody. It helps your passengers as well as the company involved. And I'm going to um, leave it at that. Carol, I'd like to say I don't disagree in any way, shape, or form with that comment. Um, to give you an idea, um, I am very much one of those people who wants the transparency, but also wants people to, to know that they have somebody available to talk to and, and provide comments to. Um, to let you know, we have a concern going on up at Cash Creek with a number of customers um, about, you know, um, having more service and having a better service. Um, and I basically gave out my phone number and contact information because, you know, I didn't want it to be any more difficult than it needed to be to, to get a hold of somebody and, and provide comments. So um, we are on the same page on that. Um, I, maybe we do, should put a bulkhead on the buses. Um, just make sure the writing's big enough to make, sure everybody can see it and, and contact us. Um, I do know it used to be on our fair media. Um, I'm not sure how, uh, how many of the buses have that on it, but um, th that's a very important per, uh, piece that everybody be able to, uh, to, to contact us. So I, I don't disagree in any way, shape or form. And I, I will say this, um, and this is my last comment and <laughs> thank you for coming, Eric. It's that, um, given how the new transfers are issued, if someone gets a transfer, it has all of the information that a passenger can use if they want to file a complaint. Um, it would tell the company the time, the date, and who the driver was. So that's something that I think is very useful and that can also um, be explained in, in, a, in a flyer or something on the bus if they want to make a, if passengers want to make a complaint, a lot of that information is there on the transfer. You know what? I have to say, Carol, that is a, an, a really awesome idea about uh, letting passengers know that that's a good way to to get the information that, that they would need because um, sometimes we do get passengers who, who complain who, who don't have all the information um, needed to, to do things appropriately. So um, I, I like that idea. Um, I try, have to think how we make sure to, uh, to, to, to write that out so that passengers would understand it. But I like that, that 
that you're absolutely right. It gives them the, the bus uh, route number. It gives them the bus number. It gives them the time and it gives them the date and, and all that's information that, yes, it does. that when people call to complain um, is much needed and, and is sometimes uh, not within the a customer's ability to answer. So, And not necessarily a complaint. It can also be a complimentary driver. Somebody right. who did something really well, I would like to, to say that as well. Correct. Or just, I mean, maybe they want to report uh, about, you know, it doesn't have to be a bad driver. It doesn't have to be a complaint. It could be, you know, um, hey, I was on the bus and, and this accident happened and I saw it or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. any number of things. But you're absolutely yes. right that that transfer would be an excellent way to make sure the customer got the information um, that we would be asking down the road. So Le Leilani, do you have a question? Um. Well, I, I just wanted to reflect um, that I am, I've been finding this conversation extremely valuable. Um, it seems really um, like, like um, a, a really important exchange. And uh, Ms. Carol Gavin, I feel um, like your, um, your direct expertise um, as as a user of the public transportation system and um, with the understanding that you have of um, the broader public's needs is it's just it just feels really important to be able to have a moment like this and Eric I'm grateful that you're here um, and, and I'm wondering Eric, is there a more formal way to build in this type of exchange into the governance structure at Yolo Bus, where you really have sort of a insider view from users out there, well, such as Ms. Carol Gavin? Uh -huh. Yeah, no, 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 I was going to say, um, I, I was going to give Carol my contact information, uh, Maria, and tell her, uh, feel free to contact me anytime on stuff like this, number one. For a more um, uh, a constant ongoing one, we do have a citizens advisory committee and uh, we will be looking, um, you know, because it's the beginning of the new year, usually that committee uh, turns over around this time. And um, we, I'm always uh, pushing to have more um, users and citizens um, involved in that process. So um, yes, uh, I would tell you we would be more than willing to take names and contact information and, and recommend to to board members um, to appoint uh, CAC members. Thanks for that information. And I, I want to acknowledge that I understand there's a big difference between the sort of pu public policy setting um, process that advisory committees can participate in and the kind of on the ground immediate feedback that is really urgently needed, I think, you know, um, out there uh, on yep. the streets. So I, I understand that both both kinds of information exchange are, are needed. So thank you so much for creating an opportunity. Are there in just I have to say, I, I really love that interaction and, and I'm, I'm excited to have people to talk to about this because um, that kind of information only makes the service better. Is there, are there any more questions? And we wanna make sure that we don't miss out on any members of the public who wanted to speak um, or had any comments. Kelly, is anybody raising their hand on the public comment side? I don't see any hands raised at this time. Well, great. Um, just so this commission knows, uh, Maria has my contact information. Um, I've told her feel free to um, distribute it. And um, like I said, I very much enjoy talking with all members uh, of the public and and finding out how we provide a better service. So um, I do look forward to being there at the travel training or, or somebody from the district. And um, I think that working to make it so that we can do IDs out there would be awesome. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we have education and advocacy. Oh, Ms. Gavin, can I just speak yeah. really quickly to the travel training? Yeah. Um, so this is an event that we had uh, pre-COVID and as Elizabeth mentioned, was also at Rancho Yolo, but um, the program consisted of the 
local paratransit or regional paratransit services. So um, attendees, it was usually like a nine to 11 event and it, it also included a step on board Unitrans and, and, and Davis Community Transit bus to get a feel for what it feels like, looks like in the bus and um, a, a ride. But uh, it was like a 9 to 11 event. We're looking at May the 20th or June the 3rd from 9 to 11. So I'm waiting to hear um, responses back from the partners. And those would be Davis, um, that would be Unitrans, Davis Community Transit, YOLO Bus. We'd also like regional transit. We'd also like a ride share. And we'd also like uh, bicycle um, alternate modes of transportation. What would happen is we have just an opening with an MC. Typically, it was a council member. And then there would be various rooms at the senior center dedicated to various services. And so you could pop in to, uh, to hear all about Davis Community Transit. Then you could go over to Unitrans and get detailed information customized to your needs. And then same with YOLO Bus. And so uh, we hope to have that scheduled again uh, in May, starting with the senior center and then also looking at satellite sites. And so uh, it was basically an all in one transportation resource fair of sorts. And again, we're looking at May the 20th or June the 3rd and commissioners, we'd have one or two volunteer commissioners who would assist with that event. Um, whether it be the sign in or helping us to get the word out. Of course, we have all these social media platforms, our newsletter and, you know, just the broader city um, Instagram, Facebook page and so forth that, that we utilize um, as well. And then each of the transportation providers would use their own um, outlets uh, for distributing information. And we'd send it out to all of the um, senior um senior communities um, and um, and in, even broader than that, because even though the, the focus was in May, older Americans for older adults, it's really frankly for all ages and all abilities. So um, just uh, I'll keep you posted on that um, as the, the date and time and the participants are finalized. Thank you, Maria. So now uh, we're at, at education and advocacy. And we're going to have an update from Leilani. Thank you, Ms. Crow Gavin. Actually, uh, Ron, uh, Ron Cole will be providing um, the update from the subcommittee today. Thanks, Ron. This is really just a brief update of what uh, we've been doing, and uh, there will be a much more comprehensive report uh, for the <clears throat> for the February meeting. Um, the subcommittee is Leilani, Lisa, and myself. Uh, we call the Health Advocacy Committee. Uh, however, <clears throat> our discussion has been much broader scope than that. And I think we've gone through many different topics over the last several months. Um, and I think one of the things that came from that was that we felt uh, there needed to be some, <clears throat> some way to uh, let more people know about our concerns and about some of the positive things that can can occur for with older people uh, in a different format than just uh, telling the commission. Uh, so the the proposal or the idea that we would would be recommending to the commission is to uh, provide to the community book group. Uh, a book on older people or on aging uh, since the population over 65 is now the largest segment of the population in in age uh, and the community book reaches many more people not only in the community but even beyond the community because the uh, author or a person is picked about the topic uh, for a Mondavi presentation, a uh, lecture. Uh, but the book itself is widely used throughout the community uh, in classes at UCD, but I think it's also a book that many people in the community are aware of and, and read for their own benefit. So that is where we would be going. We 
are hoping that the commission might uh, lend its support and even perhaps sponsor the idea of presenting a community book candidate. Uh, and that's what we will have more information about uh, and pursue that uh, discussion further at, at the next uh, commission meeting. And I think that's really all I had to say. Are there any questions? Can I just ask for a clarification? When you say nominated community book, so that would be selecting a book already out there and you know in publication, which educates on some of these issues and presents it in a kind of narrative format. Yes, I think that the criteria for the community book is quite is fairly specific, uh, but the uh, criteria that uh, is described by the uh, the people that do this uh, seems to fit very well. It, it uh, the topic of older people, I think, is uh, uh, one that <clears throat> has many sides to it, both positive and perhaps negative. Uh, but I think it's a, a worthy discussion. There are lots of questions about it. Lots of uh, questions that need to be answered. Some may be unanswerable, but I think that's one of the uh, uh, purposes of, of the uh, community book. There's no guarantee that our candidate would, would be chosen. And then I think we would have to look at some other way to, to present this topic you know, to the community. But uh, I, we feel that this is a, a worthwhile endeavor and, and worthwhile uh, trying and I think if the community or I mean if the commission uh, sort of sponsored the thought that may lend some weight to uh, choosing our our particular candidate book thank you Leilani I, I just wanted to make sure that it, um, it was clear we're taught we're referencing the UC Davis community book project um, yeah Are there any more questions? Elizabeth. Uh, yes, so at the next uh, meeting, are you going to propose some topics, some titles, authors and titles, or is that where you're going with this? Or how are you going to select, um, or how are we going to select the title? Well, <clears throat> well I think um, we have uh, looked at several books, several books. And I think, uh, uh, as I I have read most of all of them, uh, or know a good bit about them, I think there is one candidate book that I think uh, is probably the most uh, thoughtful and incorporates most of the ideas related to aging, both for <clears throat> both for people who are vulnerable, but also who are resilient and able to participate in many aspects of society. Uh, but I, th I think our, our thinking was that the committee would choose the book. I think there's probably too much reading you know, to accomplish. Uh, and the uh, candidate book has to be submitted sometime this, this spring or early summer. So I think to expect people to read all this and come up with a, a choice would be uh, rather rather difficult. So I think we're we're certainly um, willing to make the recommendation we have from the number of titles that we've generated ourselves as a committee, but um, I don't want to preclude anyone from submitting um, a title that you um, you know feel should go on our list or or joining in on a conversation um yeah, that's certainly welcome uh i'm sure between all of us there's a, a fairly large um, i think you know the material that will proceed or will be part of the uh information for the next meeting will include uh, at least a short description of the three particular books that we have have uh, been considering 
And then finally, just um, if you are thinking about titles that you feel you, you would really like to put for, forward to, to our committee, um, one aspect of the um, eligibility criteria for the community book project is that the author needs to be alive and available to come and speak at, at, at Davis in the year 2024. <laughs> Jim? Uh, yeah, I, I would just, uh, based on, well, confessing my ignorance here, uh, I hope that when you make this report at our next meeting, you'll explain exactly what the UC Davis Community Book Project is. You don't do it now, but it would be nice to have it explained so that we know what we're talking about. So that I know what we're talking about anyway. Well, I think I think there's quite a bit of information about about it, and I think the uh, criteria for picking the candidate book <clears throat> is very specific, and I think <clears throat> that can be included in our in, in the uh, uh, preceding information for the next meeting. Are there any public comments? All right. There are none. No hands raised at this time. Okay. So our next item will be affordable housing. And commissioners, this is a big topic that we agendized and it was based on um, some correspondence in November about rent increases and the topic got to the discussion of, you know, maybe having just a broader, broader discussion on affordable housing and it could go a number of ways, including one of the notes was um, uh, bringing um, representatives from various assisted skilled level of care uh, representatives to come and speak about increases and um, so that we heard, you know, various perspectives. Um, I want to note that it is it is 10 to 4 and I don't know if you want to delve into this topic now or perhaps postpone it for next month um, and appoint the uh, County Commission on Aging and Adult Services representative for the year, but that is up to you. That is all up to you. Commissioners, um, do you want to take this topic forward to another meeting? Uh, this is Jim Daniel. My feeling is that uh, this could be a fairly extensive discussion. And uh, I'd like us to really have the time uh, to talk about it and time to hear from citizen input. So my inclination is yes, move it off to February. Okay, we have a few questions. Lisa. I, um, I agree that I think the housing topic is big. Um, I did want to mention that the liaison for the Yolo County Commission on Aging and Adult Services, which I am serving as now, um, uh, we don't have to have a full discussion of it now, but I, I think it's important to uh, bring it up that I've been in that role longer than I probably should be. And I'd like to encourage um, others to think about whether you would like to, to do that. It's um, a matter of attending monthly meetings um, and reporting, um, you know, sort of what's going on here to the, the county level. And then also if there's something about the county um, that's going on, then to report that here. So just really having the communication going. Um, it's, it's an interesting, you know, uh, service and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it if you're interested, but um, I definitely encourage others to get involved in that way. Thank you, Lisa. Tom. It, the thing I'd like to suggest for the affordable housing piece is if we're going to agendize it for next month, we talk a little bit more specifically about the scope of what we want on the agenda for next month. Mm -hmm. So we have a clearer idea of what we're going to do, whether we want to invite any guests to talk about it. Um, just 
if I remember correctly, last time we met, we kind of talked about doing that this meeting, uh, scope out what we wanted to get into in terms of affordable housing and then follow up on that in the future. Thank you, Tom. Elizabeth. Um, yes, I, I also agree. We need to uh, put this off for another meeting where we really can discuss this. And I, I think I agree with Tom about um, we need to work on the scope of what we want to talk about. Um, and also, uh, thank you, uh, Lisa, for your comment about the uh, Commission on Aging. Uh, we also need to appoint a Unitrans person. Oh. So, I can uh, agendize that for next month. I'm yeah, sorry that, so if that was you omitted. don't mind. If you don't mind, thank you. Um, Leilani. Thank um, you, Elizabeth. I think that we might consider being guided by um, trying to determine if there are, are members of the public wanting to speak on this issue mm. uh, about the affordable housing before we make a decision a final decision, could we take a minute? As I, my recommendation is we take a minute and just see if anybody had set aside on their calendar and is here waiting to address this particular topic that we're thinking oh. about postponing. Thank you. Yes, is there any public comment relating to affordable housing? Thank you, Leilani, for suggesting that. Okay, it was a two-part comment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, my other uh, suggestion was, uh, what I remember when we first, um, when we first received some comment from a member of the public on, on this issue over a year ago, um, I actually uh, spoke with um, a legal advocate over at Canner, um, the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, because they're positioned to um, be able to be, uh, they have some, ex you know, more extensive and comprehensive information across the state about um, d different issues that have to do with um, fee structures and, and so on for this type of housing. And I thought it was a really useful um, conversation and it gave me a lot of information about the um, about the options that are available from a statewide perspective because I, I don't I think that locally uh, at a municipal level, I'm not sure that there's like how much influence could be had. Um, so one one suggestion I have is is to actually have a person like the person I spoke to come and 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 be available to talk to us um, and the public as we address address this. We we did have that representative through Zoom though, and I think that it's it would be a wonderful opportunity to have uh, representatives now that we can resume regular in-person meetings in March. I think that'll really help. And another suggestion might be what we also used to do was offsite meetings where we could visit various senior communities and just hear directly from residents, you know, what any concerns or, or suggestions might be. Um, and that's something I can also agendize next month to just look at the schedule of places we would visit to go, you know, talk to people and hear directly from them um, any perspectives. Uh, so I, I can certainly um, put that in there as well. Tom, do you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to give a follow-up suggestion to that. Um, first, I think it would be helpful to scope out exactly what we actually want to talk about when yeah. it comes to affordable housing. Um, Canner is a registered loyal, lawyer referral agency as well as an advocacy group. Um, and it's, you know, a large percent of its members are lawyers who sue long-term care facilities for a living. Um, and so it's certainly a valuable perspective. There's a strong consumer protection component there, um, but it's a, a somewhat narrow perspective. I think um, an organization like Leading Age, which is, again, it's um, it's a nonprofit organization, essentially an, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? like an advocacy agency for the industry. It's sort of the opposite side of the coin of um, Canner, but they represent um, both affordable housing communities as well as 
I believe it's everything across the spectrum of senior care. So assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, CCRCs, and all that sort of stuff. Um, that might be a good source of information. And then I believe either Jim or Ron mentioned at our last meeting in November, I forget the name of the agency, but it's the association that represents residents of CCRCs. Calif uh, the uh, California Continuing Care Residents Association. Yes. Yep, and we have that on our, um, yes, um, uh, possible future meetings. So that's, yeah. So, so you're just saying exactly like bring these resources that you're bringing up all together in our next meeting. And then once there's a plan in it, then we can activate that plan. Well, either that or clarify kind of our scope, because to my mind, affordable housing is a very different component or a very different piece of the sort of housing spectrum mm. than a lot of the assisted living, skilled nursing, CCRC kind of stuff. Skilled nursing has a Medi-Cal component, but for assisted living and so on, um, other than the Medi-Cal waiver program, is very much not an affordable setting. Um, and it, it should be, that's a major gap, but, it, you know, I, I, just, I think it would be helpful to clarify what we actually want to talk about when it comes to affordable housing. Are we looking at what exists in the community, you know, in Davis, what is missing in Davis? Um, do we want to get an update from David Thompson or somebody like that um, on sort of the, the current state of HUD supported um, affordable housing communities? Just what are we looking for here? Yeah. And I think it would be helpful to tailor the resources to whatever we actually want to discuss. So are we going to discuss what we're, what we're looking for or is there a motion to forward this uh, issue to the next meeting? Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I would like to move that we move this whole topic to the next meeting. Is there a second? I, one moment, um, Ron. Our, I think our... I'd like to clarify, are we talking about just senior housing or all age groups? Are we talking about young families, young couples, young indi individuals? Uh, what spectrum of housing are we talking about for what particular group? I would say our purview would be for seniors, yeah. Thank you for asking that clarifying question. All right, so Elisa. I'll second that. It's Lisa Miller. All right, thank you, Lisa. So Lisa has second the motion. Um, I'm going to call on the members. Um, if they approve Leilani. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat the exact motion? Okay. The motion is we are going to forward the affordable housing issue to the February 9th agenda, and we will discuss it then. Okay, without specific, without any plan to make the topic clarified. Um, the topic was clarified um, when Ron asked the question, but we're going to, it's going to pertain to affordable housing for seniors in Davis. Okay, but not specific to, um, to senior care facilities or that it's going to be at affordable housing for seniors in every setting that is my understanding is is there something different that i missed okay can i offer a friendly amendment to the motion uh, that, sure, we, Tom. that we carry forward this agenda item to next month and frame it as a discussion of or a, a framing of our exploration of affordable housing issues and resources going forward. And so the idea is we would sort of scope out next steps on that work plan item next month, but we aren't necessarily trying to line up speakers or that sort of thing. All right. So it's affordable housing and the resources available within the city of Davis. Would that be correct to say? 
For seniors. For seniors. Thank you, Elizabeth. Affordable housing for seniors in Davis and what resources are available? Okay. So, Jim. Yeah, sorry to <clears throat> complicate things here, but I know uh, when we had the public comment before, someone was talking about what the rate increases were at uh, their particular uh, community. And affordable housing tends to mean a particular kind of, how, I mean, a, a particular price level, right? I mean, it's affordable housing as opposed to more expensive housing. Whereas I think the question that originally brought it up was brought to us was sort of the affordability of housing and what's mm -hmm. happening with the rates uh, to people. So I just hope that we don't end up focused on what I believe is traditionally known as affordable housing, uh, which is uh, lower cost housing compared to some other facilities, for example. Would exploring senior housing as a broader topic and then, or, or sorry, you guys. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's the affordability, affordability. of senior housing <clears throat> in Davis. Exploration of the affordability of senior housing. Yes. And that would include traditional affordable housing facilities, for example, or opportunities, but also the issue of what kind of price increases people see and so on. So the original question to us from the uh, citizen. Yes. Can you read that again, Maria? So I was just going to keep it broad, but we all know what we're talking about is we kind of want to rein it in and understand the scope before we move forward. And that's what the exploration um, aspect of it is for next month. But basically exploring the affordability of housing for seniors. And I can just keep it at that if that's okay with everyone um, and, and within that framework. Um, we can hash out what, what makes sense for the commission to move forward with and how. Is there a motion to be made? Oh, I had a motion on the floor and I All think right. that I have to, uh, I have to remove, uh, rescind my motion and uh, I guess make a new motion to um, uh, move with what Maria said. Uh, our topic would be um, exploring affordability, housing affordability in Davis. Senior affordability. Is there a second? I, I will second that. <laughs> um, Leilani? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Jim? Jim? Yes, sorry, I was muted. All right. And I agree as well. I think you skipped Lisa. Oh, Lisa, I apologize. No, it's okay. I seconded it, so I, I never know yes. if it's required. <laughs> but yes, I vote yes. All right, thank you, Lisa. And I vote yes. Motion passed. Um, we already took public comment. Oh. Um, I just want to back up for one second, if I can. Um, uh, for item E, uh, the Yolo County Commission on Aging. Um, it, ordinarily, the next meeting would be as written here February 1st, but we postponed the, the January meeting. So if anyone is interested in the next meeting, that is January 17th oh, okay. at 9 a.m. And then again, it, it should be um, back to its regular schedule, February 1st. But um, that's just clarifying what's on the agenda. Thank you. Lisa, these are going to be, I'm sorry, I think you might have said it, but they're going to be in person. Um, not till uh, March, which is the same. Yeah, the same for Davis. But they're not, 
constrained by the brown yes they they're are. not constrained by the brown act over there yeah mm -hmm. yeah they are they they are they're the same they have the same rules so we'll be back in in person in march so you could attend um the next meeting the next two before um deciding for example to attend them online Are there any public comments? Commissioners, would you like to um, hold off on, you don't have to make a motion for this, but do you want to hold off on, on um, appointing or would anyone like to be a volunteer to, to attend these uh, meetings as a, re a representative of the commission? beginning with the Lisa could you attend the January 17th meeting oh yes mm -hmm. okay in that case beginning with um the February meeting and I state that as an assumption that you, you know anybody can volunteer including the person who's already which is you so um Elizabeth uh, yeah I believe we also choose an alternate right exactly correct and the same would be true next month when we do the unit trans. Hmm. Very good. Would anybody like to volunteer or if you're not fe feeling comfortable doing so and you want to attend the zoom meeting, we can um, we can just uh, have this in unit trans for next month. It's up to you. Maybe we want to wait for next month. Yeah, that's okay. And between now and then, uh, you can feel free to reach out to Lisa or our alternate Elizabeth and find out just a few more details about um, what that meeting entails other than, you know, um, I, I believe when they resume, do they alternate between 600 A Street, which is adjacent to the senior center and the county building in in uh, in Woodland or? Uh, that's a good question. I have been since Zoom. Uh, yeah. COVID, yeah. So <laughs> I will find out. <laughs> OK, and I'll find out, too. So that that can help inform because for some people, you know, having to head out of town um, might mean the difference of being able to come regularly or not. Right. Um, so we, we can postpone this and I'll add this in Unitrans to next month's meeting with everyone's approval and it doesn't have to be a formal motion it can just be in that case i think we can move to commission and staff communications and are there any public comments No hands raised at this time. Commissioners, are there any comments? Um, let's see. City Council conducted a public hearing to adopt the Downtown Davis specific plan and downtown form based code and certify the EIR prepare to project prepare for project on Tuesday, December the 13th, 2022. The council voted four to zero with Councilman Josh Chapman abstaining as he owns a downtown business to certify the environmental impact report amend the general plan to designate land use downtown as mixed use and approved a resolution repealing the core area specific plan and adopting a downtown specific plan instead. And that's the update on um, that work plan item, the Davis downtown plan. Thank you, Ms. Gavin. Any comments? I have a comment. 
it's on uh, disaster preparedness. And it really, I, I hope that this is something that we look at given the severity of the floods um, and also um, just being ready. I remember there was a website, I think it was um, with Hurricane Katrina, uh, the city had, um, San Francisco had 72.org and they ran commercials and it just told you some of the items you needed to have in your home mm -hmm. in case of an emergency. And from my own experience uh, over these past severe storms and on one occasion, uh, when the power went out, I was in the shower and I was home alone. And there was a brief moment where I panicked. And if it had not been for multiple grab bars uh, in the bathroom, that would have been a serious problem for me. So, um, and once I realized that I didn't, I knew where they, they were basically, I was able to grab something and hold tight and get out of the, the bathtub. But, um, and then I knew where some batteries and flashlights were, but I was concerned about how did other seniors and disabled people, um, how did they weather this storm? Um, Tom, I see you, you, your hand up. Yes, I wanted, I, I, just a question. It, is, is the Davis downtown plan now done for the time being as far as the commission is concerned? And should it just be you know, a completed item that we no longer need to have in our work plan? Yeah, that is a completed item since it was adopted. And that's that's exactly right why that updates there. Thank you. Any other comments? I, I just wanted to mention that the county has a um, emergency preparedness section on their website that they have been um, working on very diligently um, and um, you know, try to keep it very active. Um, it's not necessarily for floods or, you know, um, and it could be for any emergency, right? The pandemic certainly was one of the things that got it going faster, but also, you know, fires and whatnot. So I encourage people to take a look at that and um, I know that they're very receptive to feedback and additional information. Um, if you have any, that's that's something that um, I or the person the role with, has liaison can pass along uh, to to the county. Any other comment? Leilani? I think disaster preparedness is probably is is a huge issue and I'm I share concerns um, and I have observed uh, vulnerable members of my communities um, uh, kind of having an outsized disaster is having an impact on them uh, with fewer fewer resources available um, and I am aware of resources that the county has developed and provided in the form of EO and um, checklist modules that are on their website. And um, I have felt that more hands-on approach would be really helpful for, partic for particular members of and especially for more vulnerable seniors um, going through a process, maybe um, with a group of people, maybe being invited to going through their disaster planning process together in smaller, in smaller groups, be led or, in, or guided by um, other groups that, for example, church and so on. I think that um, even just at a mutual aid level where like neighbors, five neighbors, checklist together, get, you know, create their boxes together. There's something needs to happen, I believe, about a hand and a 
supported process as opposed to people information that people have to very dedicatedly um, work through. Thank you. Elizabeth? Uh, I just want to say that uh, our Rancho Yolo community has uh, reconstituted our uh, emergency preparedness uh, committee, and they are diligently working on emergency plans because we've been hard hit by almost every single one of the emergencies that have happened since like I don't know, but especially since September. So we're we're working on ours, and uh, there are some other groups around that are also working on longer term uh, concepts on emergency preparedness. So yeah, um, it's an important topic. Ron, our community at, at URC has recently raised this, this issue because we've not had any. Uh, presentations about emergency evacuation or or of any plan uh, and there are many many more new residents since the the last presentation so that is something that is in the works here because i think uh things such as evacuation of people from uh, upper floors who are not mobile and there's power outage so that elevators will not work. Uh, I think those are issues that we're looking at uh, here because that uh, is something that many people are unaware of because they're new. They've never heard a presentation about uh, uh, emergency evacuation plan. Eilani, your hand is still up. Did you did you want to make a comment? So sorry, no. Well, I just wanted to uh, piggyback on something that Leilani said and Ron, in terms of presentations um, during Hurricane Katrina. I I went through training in San Francisco. It's called NERT, Neighborhood Emergency Response Team. And there was a lot of things to, that I learned over uh, six weeks. The class was like five hours for a period of six weeks and it rotated through the entire neighborhood. So you didn't have to travel very far to attend one of the trainings. And what happened was, during the Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, the Marina District had a lot of severe damage in San Francisco. And they discovered, uh, looking back, uh, assessing what happened actually in terms of response with the emergency um, first responders, they were not prepared at all. And they, under, they went and got training in Los Angeles from LAPD and the fire department. And I've actually seen them having lived in Los Angeles. So I'm so familiar with public transportation, but having lived in Los Angeles, one of the few times I can say about the police department, in my opinion, it's very impressive to see them spring into action when there's an earthquake and how they actually do shut down the city of Los Angeles, a city that large. And so San Francisco, uh, reached out and they received training uh, from them. And from that, they uh, realized that training was very valuable and it was important to train the communities and to understand where the command centers would be, how food and water would come into the city. And it was a whole lot that they learned, but they wrote a grant for that. And, and as you said, Leilani, I think it is important, and as you said, Ron, that there be a presentation so that people would know what to do or maybe have a package they have in their home or in the basement, because I live in a regular apartment. And, and, and just putting that together and knowing what to do in the emergency and being able to go to those resources is very important, I think. Lisa, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say I, it's absolutely true that the, the NERT and the training is really important. Um, and, I, and I didn't really do it service when I said that, you know, that they've been working on the preparedness for older adults, but the Office of Emergency Services in the county 
has a great deal of information um, in addition to that. You can sign up for alerts. Um, there's evacuation zones, hazard mitigation, all sorts of stuff on that website. Um, but the there is an online module for training um, if people are interested in becoming um, more involved in their communities, they can get trained um, and then you know know exactly where to go for additional information if and when something happens. Mm. So um, again, it's it's a good place to look at um, you know, when you begin your you know searching for information at, at the very least. I think I think um, you know being being prepared in advance is is really hugely important. So. Thank you, Lisa. Are there any more uh, comments? Well, just um, I'm I would be happy to research that a little further and see about, you know, putting that out there as a resource for um, just on all of our social media platforms for folks and, you know, maybe in, in incorporate into a, a future newsletter and then, you know, maybe go from there. I don't know what like Neighbors Night Out and um, some of the other, you know, um, departments and stuff are doing relating to disaster preparedness here right now. I know that when the power went out here at the senior center, um, all of our staff was pivoted to assisting with the charging station at PD or um, as needed if in directing people to um, a, a, like a, a location shelter if it had to be activated at the Veterans Memorial Center, which has a generator. But anyway, thank you, Lisa, for that. Thanks, everyone, for that input. We can look at something here, um, offering uh, a program uh, here at the center and then again, putting putting something out there. I can agendize it this, this next month as well or for March. Um, we could talk about it further. Um, we also have Bretton Woods in February, so just want to note that. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. You know, we lots of topics uh, have come up today that are really important areas: disaster preparedness, and well, the downtown plan, transportation, uh, senior housing, affordability of senior housing, and you know. We can, we can talk about how important this is and, and you know our experience with it, but I think we need to remember to focus on what role should the commission have with respect to these topics, not just uh, let's talk about them and, agree, and come to an agreement on how important it is, but what might we do or what might we recommend to the city council? on something like on any of these topics. So I, I just hope we can focus on what the commission can do about or on any of the topics we address. Thank you, Jim. Leilani? Mine was just a really as a related comment um, to to yours, Jim, about about the what to do. Um, I was going to ask you, Maria, are you in a position to research grants um, that um, Ms. Gavin is describing that paid for the NERT training? Oh, I can follow up on that. I think that's probably within the scope of like, like PD and fire when we have a CERT team. Um, so I'll have to follow up on that. Mm hmm and then, thank you so much. And and then I think Jim, speaking to your uh, to your question, I th I think that being able to to phrase some of the observations that we make as a commission, to phrase those um, to the city um, in ways that you know provide, create some uh, recommendations. For example, reassessing. Their emergency response system or their emergency shelter system to make ensure that there's adequate shelters that um, that would be uh, emergency uh, blackouts and things like that. Uh, th that that could be sorts of observations could fairly easily be phrased into direct recommendations, um, for example. Ron. Uh, in response to uh, uh, Jim's uh, question about role, the role of the commission uh, I, in the city, I would hope that perhaps when we have our uh, city council liaison 
present at these meetings that that would give us some guidelines or some help in that area. Tom? I, I would echo Jim's comment and I think it would be valuable for any particular item that we're working on to just consider, you know, how are we fulfilling our function of advocating for the, the senior community here in Davis uh, to the city council, right? As an advisory group, what, how does each piece that we're working on contribute to betterment of the lives of the seniors in the community? And for any piece, if we're spending a lot of time on it and don't have a takeaway or a recommendation or something like that, I, I do think we're missing an opportunity. So thank you for your comment, Jim. I think that was an excellent point. Are there any more comments? Okay. So possible future meeting items. So we've got centralized database for affordable housing. We've got air pollution impact on seniors. California Continuing Care Resident Association. Are there any comments? Are there any public comments? Are there any, Leilani? Um, I would like to recommend that we consider removing the air pollution impact on seniors as a standing future. I believe that there are several mechanisms, both at the state level and also at the municipal level that monitor and um, regulate air for all um, people. And I believe that that's adequate enough to um, account for impacts on seniors and other vulnerable members. I don't believe that we need to continue um, on our list. Tom? Do I recall correctly that the centralized database piece came up with our guest uh, last meeting, and I'm drawing a blank on her name, but... Um, Dana, Dana Bailey, and on, on a script version, she'll provide updates when available, yeah. Okay, so since there's a, a unit within the city working on that, I would also propose that we drop that one off there and just um, wait to hear updates from staff. Jim? A trivial thing, <laughs> uh, Maria, the CE in residence for Calcra should be a TS. It's the oh, thank you. It's the People's Association. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate that. Are there any more comments before we go to the motion to remove these two items? Jim, your hand is still up. So is there a motion on the floor to remove centralized data base for affordable housing and air pollution impact on seniors? Oh, you know what? I, I, would, I would like to make a comment about the centralized database. Um, I hope that it um, is something that we can bring up easily on our agenda uh in the future without having too much difficulty i would not like that that topic to disappear altogether uh, i uh, along those lines how do we keep track of things if they do fall off that that was my other question um i agree with elizabeth i think that one is particularly that important. that i mean that that is a helpful tool for all of us to to keep it on there um i know that in the circumstance of the central database that dana did state that as she had an update that she would come back to us but i mean there there's something to be said about you know there's there's pros and cons for for keeping things on i mean it'll certainly be part of you know kind of our our working work plan um and uh but um, I mean that that's up to the commission to 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 keep it on to keep it on or not. 
So are there going? I can. I mean, I can. I can provide an. Um, I I have an internal list of items. I mean, but for the. I'm sorry, Miss Gavin. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please go. Oh, go ahead, Maria. Oh, I, I was just gonna say I. I um, I have kind of an a, this this item and um and Yolo bus routes are some things that are kind of like on shelved for now, but that I kind of want and offsite meetings. They're not all necessarily always on this list for upcoming because um, they're like maybe more future. Um, but I mean, I can make that commitment to you commissioners that you know it this won't fall off um, even if it's not on this or every single month's agenda. Okay, uh, that makes me feel a bit better, Maria. Um, because this is just a possible future meeting items. It, this is not a commitment. So, um, but the fact that you do keep some sort of list somewhere, mm -hmm. that's good. I'm not sure what the disadvantage of keeping it on there is actually. Um, but I, I do have to get going. I apologize. I do too. I do too. <laughs> so the motion is to remove centralized database for affordable housing and air pollution impact on seniors out of possible future meeting items. Is that correct? Is there an, is there um, a motion to to remove these items? Ms. Gavin, why don't we why don't we um why don't we leave the centralized beta database on there? Um, because there isn't a, a disadvantage for doing that necessarily, despite despite the fact that Maria is offering to keep track of it for us. Uh, what why don't I why don't um we leave that one on there? Remove air pollution. And um, I move forward there um, with a vote from that. Does did I catch that right from the mood of this room? <laughs> okay. Okay. So there is a motion to remove air pollution impact on seniors. I second that. That's Elizabeth. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um. So then we're at the subcommittee reports. No, we have to vote on that. Vote. Oh, yes, we do. This is a democracy still. All right. The motion was made to remove air pollution impact on seniors. Um, Leilani? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Ron? No. <clears throat> no. Lisa? Yes. Tom? Uh, yes. Jim. Yes. And my vote is yes. The yeas have it. Um, so now the Yellow County Commission on Aging and Adult Services. We um, have not had a meeting since I last reported. Um, so there's nothing to report there. Are there any public comments? Unitrans Advisory Committee. Uh, there's not a lot to report at this time, but the next meeting is uh, tentatively scheduled for January 26th at four o'clock, and it is still on Zoom. All right. Are there any comments from the commissioners? Okay. Well, that would mean that this meeting is in adjournment. Thank you, everyone. We discussed a lot of things that are very important to seniors. I want to thank all of you for giving your time today, your research and expertise, and I wish you a happy new year, and I will see you again on February 9th. Ms. Gavin, thank, thank you, thank you so you. much for chairing. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank all right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.